I get energized by doing that part to keep being able to do my job there because yeah. it's the other part's more draining to me. So I probably feel well. The, I've more actually gotten towards you as well as like, wow, she's pretty smart and has some good, you know, and uh, not necessarily <clears throat> answers because I don't know if you're giving them answers. It's perspective, more, yeah. yeah it's, it's, I have a different point of view. Well, and it makes them think. The and bosses like, oh. have started coming up to me and saying, "Oh, well, Thomas is." you know, talking to, he, he actually came in and said this to me and he's been so quiet and he's been here over a year and he keeps to himself. And he, um, we actually had two carving stations at the buffet. And so he, um, chef asked him to do one of them, which was a little surprising for him because chef usually would ask me to do that. But then I got to take care of the rest of the buffet, which is, I think what he was more concerned about. And, and chef even gave him a compliment saying, um, he was talking to the guests and he was kind of making conversation like chef does. And, um, and he really complimented him on, you know, kind of that more coming out of his shell. And some of the conversations we've been having is you have you have something to offer the world. You need to offer it. You need to give and, and, and you know, people want to hear it. People need to hear what you have to say. And, you know, you you are a value. And so that's a lot of, I think, the conversations I have with the staff there. But that's a lot of the conversations I think people don't understand. Everyone has value. But you're not going to be the Gary Vee of the world, right? You're not necessarily going to be Tony Robbins or you're not going to necessarily be uh, Tiger Woods. Doesn't mean you don't have value. You don't have to be a rock star to have value. You don't have to be a famous person to have value. And I think that's a lot of the conversations we end up having, especially in that in their early 20s as some of these these kids, this is what I call them kids, but the, they just, they are so self-conscious about things that they don't think they have something to add and be valuable for and they don't understand that they are valuable just in who they are and once you own that then the value you have to offer the world or other people will come more forward because you're putting more value on it I know I keep using the value word but it's really it's that whole I'm not enough thing I think that every human being has it just manifests itself differently do you think it's worse with these generations behind us because of social media I know that people say that. I don't feel that way. I feel like everyone has it. Theirs is just more obvious because with social media, it's, it's out there more. It's it's not as private. Whereas, you know, if you grew up in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s, there wasn't all this stuff on blast. It was It's not all out there for everyone to see. All the um, highlight reels that people put out on Facebook, right? Because we're not seeing the struggle we, we see, oh, they're an overnight sensation. Not, that is never true for anyone. No one is an overnight sensation. You don't see the 10 years prior or five years prior of the hard work it took for them to have that overnight sensation thing that everyone talks about. With Facebook, that highlight reel of all these people put out there all their great stuff, they don't put, most people don't put out their dark moments too, right? Mm -hmm. Which in one way is positive because you don't want everybody putting their dark moments out there and then people reveling in that and then, getting depressed because they watch everybody's dark moments. And at the same time, you can't believe everyone's hype that that's their whole life all the time. And that's where I think the difference is, is this generation sees that. And so maybe they are still playing small, but I think I played small and I didn't have, I didn't have social media growing up. I didn't want to be noticed. I wanted to be quiet and unassuming. And I think there's a lot of people that way, you know, Bernadette, I remember when I met her, I would ask her, Oh, I just want to be quiet and unassuming. Now, Look at her flash forward 10 years. She's now a manager and she's out front doing trainings and she's leading these huge meetings with high level managers for a county. And how is that being quiet and assuming? It's not anymore. But she started to own her own greatness and not hopefully through our friendship, but her personal growth as a person and realizing the value that she is as a person and the value she can add to the world we live in. Did she just grow up and she became an adult who's able to talk to other adults? Or did she really change her trajectory of she was going to be a mouse and yeah, you, you, you pushed her, prepped her, coached her to transform herself into the manager leader she is. I mean, I met adults, adult, very adult people that right. are still very mousy. Maturity, progress, change in perspective all come from a series of choices and working through what comes up when you're doing that. So to go back to the example of being a mouse and becoming coming into owning yourself in a different way where you can be a leader. 
Um, and a leader can be in anything. You're, you can be a leader of a family. You could be a leader of your friends. You could be a leader of your work. Being a leader comes from making choices. So in the example of coming from a mouse quiet and unassuming and going into being a leader, that was a series of choices and growth. It would not have happened without the series of choices and growth to happen with it. You have to make that choice repeatedly. It's like what they say with a good marriage. You have to continually choose to be married and have a good marriage than to just let it happen. It doesn't work that way. It's a relationship. So it's a relationship with yourself to be the person that you want to become or you know you can be. However you want to look at that. So if that's the case, Bernadette would not have gone from being the quiet and unassuming person to the leader that she is now in her family and at work had she not done the work to do it. And when I say work, I don't mean her job work. I mean the work on herself, the work on her perspective, the work on knowing her value and the value she could add to a conversation, the value she could add to her family, the value she could add to her workplace. When you see your value, you have value and you know that someone can benefit for the positive from it, that is what you need to add. And we all have something different to add value wise by who we are and what we bring to the table. So it's choice. And when choice happens, when you choose to be a different person or to be a better version of yourself or to be a leader, there's choices that need to take place and then there are consequences. Now, usually when we hear the word consequence, we hear a negative thing. But when you work and you get a paycheck, the consequence is the paycheck. That's money. That's not a negative thing. That's right. not a, it's, it, consequence is not a negative or a positive. It's the meaning we attach to it. The meaning of the consequence of making a choice could be that you have different feelings that show up. Inadequacy. I don't feel like I'm enough. Or a consequence could be, oh, that felt really good. I want to do that again. You have to work with the feeling that comes up when you make a different choice than what you're used to making. This is part of reprogramming yourself to be the person that you want or need to be. So it sounds like all you need is some positive feedback and you'll grow in the right way. If the sunlight's that way, you'll grow that way. If the sunlight's that way, you'll grow that way. All you need is positive feedback and that's the way you'll grow. But isn't that also how people grow the wrong way by getting positive feedback from the wrong people or the wrong way? You're correct. Sure. You will grow in the area in which you get praise. I wouldn't say positive feedback because I would use the word praise. If you're getting praise from somebody that says, hey, you'd be really great to do sales, but it happens to be the local drug dealer, that's going to be a bit different than getting praise from uh, the guy at the mini mart who says, hey, you're really great at sales and, and explaining how products work or how something tastes or whatnot. That's going to be a different way that you're going to choose to put your energy, right? Mm -hmm. Because we all want to feel like enough. And when we get positive praise, we feel like we're good enough, even if it's just in that moment. The more that happens at positive reinforcement, the, you're gonna grow in that way. That's where a lot of the thought leaders in, in positive thinking and momentum and creating the life you want, they talk about the five people you hang out with the most are who you are. And so there are some people that are in, in the realm of, they feel really lacking in certain areas of their life, so they will purposefully seek out five people that are better than them in a particular area so that they can become better. I'm not gonna become a better tennis player playing, you know, my sister who never plays tennis versus going and playing with Serena Williams, right? She's gonna make me a better tennis player because I'm really gonna have to strive and work at fundamentals to be able to even play with her, let alone try and beat her someday. You want to be with people that are going to support that. I think a very commonplace thing is when people want to change the way they eat. So we call that a diet, mm. if you want to call that a diet. Mm. But we want to change our eating plan is, is, is a nice way to say that. If I want to change my eating plan to being more keto, which would be no sugar, low carb, and only healthy carb, I'm not going to go hang out with my friends that go to the donut shop every week or go to the bakery because that's not going to support that eating plan it's going to be much more difficult to make that change to the person I want to be, which is eating in a different ma method. You, but you make, you make changing your circle, making changing your friends, like, you know, let me go on Amazon, let me just roll through my Rolodex, I'm going to hang out with different people. So if, you're not, if you can't find positive people mm -hmm. who want to hang out with you mm -hmm. and give you positive feedback, then you know you don't really have a chance to better yourself that drastically. You know, back to the crab syndrome. 
if that's where I live, hey. if a single mom, uh, dead end sales job, I'm in the cubicle, the rest of the crabs are keeping me down. How do I still improve myself, even if it is just for myself? If I can't get Tony to tell me how awesome I am with his, you know, with his magic, or even somebody like you, mm-hmm. who I might get to talk to once a month if, every other week, I mean that, that's that's medicine. It's better than nothing. But it, I don't think most people can just change their circle. I, I think the great thing about that is I don't necessarily, depending on what the um, habit or choices that you want to change. They don't necessarily say that you have to drop all your friends. Now, if all your friends are drug dealers, that might be a challenge. And you don't want to do drugs anymore or be in that realm. But using the example of food, the great thing about social media is that you can use those to find even virtual friends to start with to start changing that group. I don't mean to necessarily do it overnight. As you learn that process, change the groups that you're interacting in on Facebook, on Instagram, on whatever social media is happening. And then that's a start to give you exposure and support in the method that you're going towards. Plus, I'm a big advocate for um, books and different things. Those thought leaders that wrote the books for the things that you want to do, or podcasts even, they are going to support you in changing your thinking about the direction you want to go in. You can do that every day. That's something that you can definitely surround yourself with every day. If I no longer want to be, um, you know, if I have a alcohol problem, I'm not going to go hang out at a bar anymore, right? So where could you hang out instead? Where are the people at that you want to interact with? Church. <laughs> well, you know, there's church. Church is a great way. There are multiple groups. There are meetup groups that if you're into uh, different kinds of spirituality and things that um, may be in line with you. There are other ways to get involved with people that are going to be more like-minded to the person that you want to be, be or who you are becoming. So there are options without, you know, um, for example, I, I have a different way of eating than my parents. And if I go to my parents' house and my parents are cooking or I'm hanging out with my parents or my family, I can still eat a different way. I can choose to eat beforehand. I can choose to bring my own food. There's different ways of doing it. And I don't have to say, well, because my, my family doesn't want to eat keto or whatever eating plan that I'm doing, mm-hmm. um, paleo or all those things, doesn't mean that I can't be with my family. There are just ways that I would have to set myself up for success by making these choices ahead of time. There's a lot of tools there. If I just need find a positive feedback and I find a friend who's willing to send me, hey, you're great, that sounds like great, you look great, your hair's good, your podcast was awesome, versus what do you do as a coach, mm-hmm. as a counselor, mm-hmm. as a, what, what's another word we could use just so people understand there's a, a broader sense to what you bring instead of, you're, you're not a hired friend. So what are you mm-hmm. doing to not just... Oh, you know, yeah, you can hire me as a friend and I'll tell you you're awesome. Is that what a coach is? Because I see the coaches on Instagram like, you're awesome. And they put out quotes of, you're wonderful because you want to be wonderful. Is that all a coach is? Is it just a hired friend to make you feel good? Professional coaches, people that do it as a profession that are um, practical. They actually have practice in it. They have experience in it. Are not your friend. They will be friendly, they can be kind, they can be loving, they can be caring towards you. They're um, going to tell you the hard truth where your friend won't because your friend's going to be afraid that you're not going to be their friend anymore. And a coach is there to help guide you to what you really want. Praise may be one sliver, one slice of what a coach does. They're going to encourage you, if that's what you call praise. They encourage you to make the changes and process the feelings and thoughts that come up to make the changes that you want. And coaches help with perspective. They listen to your language because we'll just start talking. And I mean, even when I'm working with my coach and I have a coach, I have more than one coach, depending on the area I'm working on. The coach is going to listen when I speak freely about the language I use around a topic. And it's going to tell us a lot as coaches what you're really thinking deep down unconsciously about that topic you'll say certain things and you won't even realize it'll come out of your mouth and a lot of times a coach can just be that mirror and they say 
and they repeat exactly what you said back more like a question and you stop and you think, wow, I did just say that. Oh, hold on. Let me, let me, let's, let's dig into that. Or they ask this question, a pivotal question, a quality question that you haven't asked yourself about that topic. So if you're working on your career and you're talking about your job and how you view your job and you keep saying you want a promotion and you want more money and you want all this this success at the current job you have, yet the coach is hearing you talk about it as it's a daily grind. You don't like it. You're not happy there. So are you really in the place of success where you're going to add the most value so you can get the most value in return? A coach does more than just, is not just a cheerleader. Let's use that language. It's not just a cheerleader. It's someone who's going to ask you sometimes the hard questions. Sometimes it's the questions you haven't thought of. They're not there to tell you what your life is to be. They're to help you discover what you want your life to be and perhaps give you some options or things you haven't thought about on how to get there. But they're not going to tell you the formula for your life like I think some parents do. For you to be happy, you have to do X, Y, Z. You have to do one plus two equals three and then four, you're going to be happy. That's not how that works. It's different for each person because there's not a formula for each person's happiness, contentment, or success. Each of us is made differently. Therefore, all of those things are going to be different. And a coach has to be flexible. They have to pay attention to you. They have to listen to what you want and need. They need to be resourceful and getting you to the place that you want to be, not where the coach wants you to be. Okay. When you play football... If, you're, if you have a football coach, they want you to be successful in your position and they're going to tell you strategies and they're going to have you run drills and exercises and experiment with different things because each player is different. Even if you have a bunch of running backs, they don't all have the same agility and skill that the other one has. So they're going to use those to the best of their ability. They can work with you as a group, but then they also have to work with you individually. Three to five of the hardest questions you've had to ask somebody you were coaching. As simple as it seems, I think one of the hardest questions that I've asked somebody is, what do you want? And, and I say, what do you really want? I think so many people are so used to what, I, I don't want this, I don't want that, I don't want this, I don't want that. And that's all well and fine, and that can leave clues and point you in the direction of what you really want, but that is not specifically what you really want. To me, that's the number one question that is the most difficult and hard to ask sometimes because sometimes it's when you ask the question. What do you mean when? When you ask the question. Um, I've had the privilege of working in a professional environment and being able to coach people in a personal way because they had set up, uh, they had weekly appointments with me, sometimes bi-weekly appointments, to do business coaching or coaching around the work environment that they were professional coaching. And at times... The individuals would come in and needing to talk about something personal because that's what was distracting them. That was what was on their mind. That was what was keeping the focus away from their job. Mm -hmm. And it had to do with their wife and they were having difficulty and transitioning from the work environment to going home environment and what they felt like their wife not giving them the space they needed to, to make that transition. Having asked some questions so I could have a better understanding of what was going on and being able to do that, but asking that question when they get really upset about you know should they stay or should they go what's going on all those things and then asking well what do you really want when you ask that question the timing of that question can be really pivotal and can be really challenging because that answer in that moment could be different than that answer the next time we may or may not ever talk about so, so within that framework of dissecting their problems right. asking it you're going to get different answers. Right. And so that would be the number one question. The number two question, again, these, these, they're, to me, they're linked. But the, the number two question is um, going back to the idea of everyone somewhere deep down inside of them doesn't feel like they're enough in some area of their life or in their life. Getting to the point of asking someone who's in a really, uh, let's call it a dark place in the moment and asking them what would it really take for you to feel like you're enough sometimes it's not necessarily the answer that comes from that but it's the thoughts and feelings that come from asking the question that helps the person understand what is really happening inside of them in that moment 
that would lead us to where they need to go or want to go next. So asking someone who's in a more sensitive, if you want to call it frail or in a harder spot, you know, what do you really want? Or asking them what would make you feel like you're enough. There's a formula in each person, not one that I prescribe to you, but there's a formula that we each have on what does it take for me to feel loved? What does it take for me to feel intimate love? What does it take for me to, to feel successful? All of those things are different for each one of us, but somewhere in there is a formula or a method for us to feel those things. So for me to ask somebody, what would it take for you to feel enough? Whatever topic we're talking about in that moment could be like, what would it, um, I think a lot of people could relate to, what would it make you feel like you're enough to your parents, to your father, or your mother, whoever it is you're seeking approval from, to your boss? What would it make you feel like that all of a sudden I'm good enough to be where I'm at or who I am and, and not feel like an imposter or not feel like I'm failing all the time or feel like I've that I suck, I completely suck. So what is it? And if you tease it out or talk to someone enough, you can get pieces of it. And when you start to repeat it back to them and say, so you would feel like your dad's proud of you if he said it, has he ever shown it to you in another way? How would that look like if your dad showed he was proud because maybe he's not a verbal person. A lot of dads probably are not. That's just not their preferred method of communication. Old school dads. So that that being the case, when have you ever felt like your dad was proud of you? And a lot of times somebody would say, not at all, never, right? If you give them the space and time and ask them questions, generally speaking, you get somebody, well, I kind of found it, felt it like this one time when mm. I was, you know, whatever. And you get the story. And then when you start to ask questions about the story, you start to figure out what their formula is and what they need to look for to feel like, dad's proud of them or whatever it is that they're really searching for. So though, I would say those are the top two hard questions and, and some of it's the question and some of it's the timing of the question. What do you want? What makes you feel fulfilled? What makes you feel like you're enough? They'll sound like the same question. That's why I, I mentioned earlier that it's, they're really um, interconnected in my okay. opinion. I think a lot of questions are interconnected as simple as we try to be sometimes, we're not always simple in our thinking or simple in how our thoughts and emotions interact with the world around us. So what would be a number three? What would be the third hardest question you've had to ask someone? Why are you doing what you're doing? So what are you gaining from what you're doing? And sometimes if you're talking to somebody who has an addiction issue, and I mean addiction to, could be illegal drugs or um, alcohol or things that are not easy, uh, even sugar, um, but individuals with an addiction, it's like, well, what are you gaining from that addiction? And when, again, the timing is another part of that. And when you're asking someone who wants to stop doing whatever the addiction is, and you're asking what you're gaining from it, usually it's the back to question number one, what I don't want. And they're telling you everything that how their life is falling apart because of it, how things are bad because of it. We wouldn't be doing something if we weren't gaining something from it. I can relate to, a, to having a sugar addiction, really wanting sugar all the time. And when I say sugar, it's, you know, sugary products, not just sugar in food, but like candy and candy bars and um, cake and ice cream and, you know, that kind of sweet level of sweets and wanting it all the time. There's a little high you get from it, if you will, because it's sugar. It tastes good. It's sweet. Our, our, our chemistry is meant to to want that and and what was I getting from it well you know my dad liked a lot of sweets so there's some connection I probably was getting from oh well you know my dad likes sweets I like sweets so there's some connection of family connection there and feeling part of a group and part of um, the the sweet taste of it and it would taste good and you get a little excited like a little kid that I had some sugar and so there's these gains that you're getting from it and then I'm getting self-care because look I gave myself a treat I gave myself something nice. Jeez. I gave myself something, you know, so there's these different connections to it that we're not realizing. Again, thoughts and emotions that are attached to this food. And, and I can give you a great example. Um, I was uh, staying with my mom and 
Uh, my dad was uh, out of town for a, a month or more, and I was staying with my mom to keep her company while he was gone. And I started craving donuts, and I hadn't wanted donuts in like months, years, or whatever. And I kept craving donuts, and I kept craving donuts. And I'm like, so I finally went. I was like, okay, I'll go get a donut. Let's see what happens. And I did not enjoy the donut at all. I didn't even finish the donut. It, it was did, didn't taste good to me. And when I sat and reflected on it and asked myself some quality questions, I came up with, well, what would happen? Again, connection with my dad, because my dad and I would go do early morning projects. And what did dad do before he would go get early morning projects is we'd go have a donut together and then go do this early morning project. So quality time being a important factor in my life, that was quality time. And I was missing quality time because I had all this time with my mom, but my dad wasn't there and that was unusual. Then I realized, okay, well, I'm missing connection with my dad. So what did I do? Well, the next time, because my mom and dad were talking every night, what did I do? I popped on the call with my mom. It was like a FaceTime kind of call and did a little connecting. I also did some things around the house that would be more what my dad would do around the house. And it was like I got that connection piece that I felt like I was lacking because I, right? But it was my quote unquote addiction to sugar was the trigger for that. Hmm. And so when you start to realize what, again, addiction to alcohol, if it's an addiction to drugs or whatever, there's something you're gaining from that. And if you want to call it a secondary gain, that's some language that people use. It's the gain you're getting and that you're not conscious of. And so when you start to look at different things that may not be the healthiest patterns that you'd like to have, um, if it's sitting on the couch zoning out watching TV or movies for, you know, binge watching. And when you start to look at why do people sit and do that? Well, one, you're escaping because now I'm living in other worlds on TV, on, on, on the shows, and I'm not having to live in my world. Maybe you're watching something that, well, their life is worse than mine, so I don't feel as bad, right? So there's all these different things that we don't really realize why we're escaping and how we're escaping and what does that mean? That's where, again, knowing what you want and making the choices to go there. And then that's where a coach comes in to ask you the questions because they're to be unbiased. They, they, all they want for you is your success, not necessarily how your success is going to be. They're there to serve you for your best interest. They're not there to say, Hey, you know, you're a piece of crap. Although there are those coaches that that's their methodology. Um, I don't come from that place. I come from a place of kindness. I want your greatest good. If I gave you an experiment or an exercise to do, I remember in basketball, I'll use that analogy when we would run lines and that's when you're, you know, doing some agility and you're running and you're getting endurance and you're getting different things from it. If you didn't do that, you wouldn't get those benefits. So if I gave you an exercise or an, ex sometimes they call it an experiment to try out and a methodology to use and you don't do it, there's something to learn from that as well as there's something to learn from when you do do it, we learn what, why are you resisting it? We learn something else about what is a speed bump to the success in this area. What are you fearing? What are you, what's getting in the way? What's really a root issue there? So, so there's no bad or wrong or, or unhelpful answers from somebody that you're coaching. No matter what they say, it's going to help you help them down a path somewhere. Absolutely. Now you have individuals that are, just not committed to their outcome and that's a whole nother there that's a whole nother thing you have to participate in your rescue so if i come if somebody's drowning and i go out there to try and save them and they try to drown me that doesn't work right they've got to relax so i can put my arm around them and and pull them in and swim in if they keep flailing and trying to push me down so that they can go up and they think that's going to rescue them that's just going to kill us both right so you have to participate in your own rescue. This isn't like I can come in and let's use a heart surgeon. A heart surgeon can come in and unclog your, you know, do a triple, quadruple bypass on you. But if you don't participate in the process, you're still going to die, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, you don't follow the instructions after the fact. You don't start taking care of yourself in a different way. You don't change your methodology. You know, you got to participate in your own rescue. What's the difference between... A coach and a counselor, and I know they're close, but really where do we cross the line into psychology, psychiatry? Where's the line that is obvious to a coach or to you that, you know, this is, there's, there's tools that you need that kind of a person for? 
That's a great question, and and I would say at times it would be a difficult uh, question to answer. Um, I've had some training and some understanding and worked in different environments to understand mental illness a little different. There are some things where people have chemical imbalances and there's a coach can support somebody in that role. They can't help them the same way that someone who needs a chemical balance change um, with. Now, I know some health coaches would tell you, well, you know, they just need to change their, the way they're eating, their diet, their food plan, things like that. I think that's helpful. I don't think that's the same for everyone. So that's one part of the population. For the general population of needing um, a, a counselor or a therapist, it, it has to do with the mindset. It has to do with the challenges that the person is facing. Um, I think coaches can help with a lot of that. Having gone to a therapist myself, I could have benefited from a knowledgeable coach. I was not knowledgeable at the time of how that all worked and it wasn't as prevalent as it is now. Um, and even now it's still not as prevalent depending on what circles you're in. That's why some coaches call themselves consultants because they don't want to be called a, a life coach or whatever language that people use. So with a therapist, um, there can be some really deep seated, uh, traumas, um, and difficulties. If a person hasn't worked through certain levels of those, that would be more difficult to work with a coach. And I'm thinking of a very traumatic things like. I think we've all had different kinds of traumas in our life, but I'm talking about big traumas where, you know, uh, brutally raped, um, things like that, like real high level things. Uh, maybe even, I think veterans could be supported and progress with a coach. Um, if you have high levels of PTSD, I think that you, you might need a counselor. You need somebody that understands. Now there are some coaches that are veterans themselves. So they have some different perspective and tools. So I think a lot of times if you have a coach that has personal experience in the area that you feel challenged is best. And if there are some really deep seated uh, challenges, then that's when you, you could seek out both. And if you can find a therapist and a coach that would work together, I think that you'd be the most successful. My concern about some therapists is there are different methodologies or um, philosophies on how to do therapy. There are some therapists that will allow you to sit on their couch for as long as you want. And I don't mean time wise, but years wise, you know, you can sit an hour every week for 20 years and talk about the same thing over and over and just keep regurgitating out and complaining about the same thing. And they'll listen to you and ask questions and take notes. And, and that's one methodology. Um, I prefer myself cognitive behavioral therapist because I think you'll make the most progress there because they're going to, be similar to a coach and finding out where your deep seated things are coming from and how to change the behaviors, cognitive, which is your brain, uh, behavior, which is what you're doing, therapy, and get you to move in, the, in, the, in a better direction. So if you're really looking at making progress, I would go that route or I'd go with a coach. Most coaches, professional coaches, you have to make, you have to make progress. It's about making progress. And please don't misunderstand that too. You know, you have to be able to run a four minute mile. <laughs> now, if you're going to an athletic coach, that might be the case. They're looking at you making progress to the future that you want. And that is all determined by the conversation. When you start to catch yourself and, and make changes, it's all going to be there. Most coaches will, um, professional coaches will sell um, their services in packages or, or bundles or whatever you want to call it, where it's six months or it's a year or it's 13 months, they, everyone does that differently. There's not a standard. And they do that because you need that amount of time to, make the pro to show that you're making progress and continue to work together. You want to interview your coach just as much as a coach wants to interview you. Whereas you go to a therapist and they probably will just take whoever comes through the door more so than a coach will because they want to make sure it's a good match. A ethical coach is going to make sure that they can assist you to where you want to go and you want to make sure that they've had experience in the area that you want to go. You're not going to go to a business coach and get health coaching, right? It's That's not where their successes are probably at and that's not where you necessarily want to go. So you want to make sure you get a coach 
that has experience in the area that you want to be successful in. You, you kind of touched on my last question. So how long does it take to fix somebody? That implies people are broken, and I don't believe that people are broken. So that is a great – that does that does happen. So people think that they're going to come in and get fixed. Just like I – let's go back to the heart surgeon analogy. A heart surgeon doesn't necessarily fix you. They clean out the valves, you know, when they do the bypass, or they bypass the valves that are blocked. I should say it that way. Um, however, they didn't fix you. They made your heart work for right now, but that didn't fix you. Um, you're still, if you still eat the way you're going to eat, you're going to still have the same issue. So a coach isn't there to fix you, just like a football coach doesn't fix you. They give you strategies to help you be more successful in the areas you want to be successful in. There are so many variables involved in helping someone make progress and be successful. I think that's the question that I would answer in that how participatory are you? How much action are you willing to take? How badly do you really want it? And how badly do you want to hold on to your old habits? Health is a one that I think most people can relate to. So, you know, if, if you want to, you know, lose weight or you want to get healthy food wise, those are two different goals. You can include both of them, but the strategies involved is, is get, might be different on how do you get healthy and how willing are you to willing to take the steps to do it. So, the steps would be, you know, what most people are is what you eat and exercise. That's what most people look at, right? So if a coach says, well, this is what I'm going to prescribe to you. And they say, well, okay, you know, we need to work out four days a week. These are the kind of workouts you need to do. They need to be this long and did it right. And they prescribe all this to you. They prescribe what you should be eating and probably not eating. How participatory are you in that for how long? What, so you went a day without eating a cupcake, but you know, the rest of the week you're eating cupcakes and you're only working out for the five minutes for two times a week, you know? So it's, there's too many factors in each of us being individuals and what our really, our outcome that we want to have is that I wouldn't say that, oh, well, you know, anyone's going to be, you know, where they want to be in this amount of time. How much action are you willing to take? Because most people get stuck in thought and they don't take action. Even if you think you're going to fail, you might as well take the action because you're going to know that sooner and have more information to make a different decision quicker than if you just keep thinking about it, not taking action for another two weeks. And for me as a coach and as a client, two coaches currently and before, it's the work you do between the calls that really matters than the work you do on the calls with the coaches. Do you really think you can make a big difference in, in even just one one visit, one session, one call? I believe just talking to I can make a difference in anyone that I talk to if they choose to apply what I what I give them as value. If I sat down and talked to somebody for five minutes, ten minutes on a topic that they were interested in, that they let me know they were interested in, I believe that if they applied that knowledge, their life would be better for it. So anyone that I've worked with for extended periods of time, six months, a year or longer, has made even more improvements. And we end up working on, you know, they, they come with one thing and we end up working on three or four other things while we're working on things. Because when one, it's, it's kind of that analogy of all boats rise together. And it's if they have all these boats with the different things they want in life. As you start to in, improve one area of your life, other areas start to improve as well. Because the idea with coaching, it's how you approach life. It's how you're approaching the situation. It's how you're approaching how you think, how you feel about what you're going for. So a lot of times, if I give a strategy or idea about how to get a promotion at work, we can use that example, or pay increase, there's certain things that you would need to do. Again, focus is one of them. What are you focusing on? What are you putting your energy into? What actions are you taking? Just using that, purely that idea and focusing on another area of your life, relationship with your mom, a relationship with your, your significant other, a relationship with your best friend. You miss your best friend. You don't, they're not, you're not spending time together anymore. Well, why is that? Well, are you focusing on that? Are you giving attention to it? Are you taking action towards it? Or are you expecting it to just show up in your lap? As you start to focus on things and you start to ask questions differently of yourself, that's what thinking is, is asking questions of yourself and answering it. 
is if you start doing that in the different areas of your life, it can't help but improve if you apply intentional action to it. And when I say intentional action is that you've really thought about where you want to go and taking steps to go there. I'm not saying that you have to, if you want to, you know, a promotion or a pay increase or you want to increase your health, you want to reduce your fat content in your body. All of these things, if you focus on them and take action, I guarantee most people know how to, what it takes to lose weight. Whether it's the methodology you would enjoy or not is a whole nother thing, but reduce your calories, increase your, you know, increase your activity. But how many of people actually apply that? So with a coach, we start asking questions of what is your limiting belief that it's not possible? Is What is it that's keeping you from doing it? And so that's where it comes in, where you got to start looking at those different things and taking action towards them. When you take intentional action, you get intentional outcomes. So Edison, they say, you know, found 10,000 ways not to make a light bulb. So if you keep taking action, you might find a way that that doesn't work for you, but you're going to find another one because you keep your focus on what you want instead of what you don't want. Well, that didn't work. I don't want that. I think a lot of times it's also true when we try something new, we try a new activity, we try it once or twice as adults <coughs> and then we stop. Here's the thing. If your kid was learning how to walk and the kid tried two or three times and didn't walk, would you then say, I don't know, sit down. You're never going to walk for the rest of your life. Mm. Right. But as adults, we do that. Right. As adults, we go, oh, I, you know, I went to the gym once or twice and I tried the treadmill and I didn't like it. So I'm not going to go back. Well, maybe the elliptical is your thing. Maybe you need to go outside because you enjoy the fresh air while you're doing it instead of standing stationary and trying to run in place. Like we don't try a different enough variety. So we just have to try something else. And that's where sometimes a coach comes in and says, well, did you try this? Did, did you try that? Well, but you're not going to try and walk anymore. So just get a wheelchair because we're done. Right? Like it just doesn't make, I mean, it sounds silly, but when we really think about it, that's yeah. what happens.